Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream. Today, need pliers? Now you can make them with a 3D printer. We look at maker culture and the future of development. Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is here looking out for your live feedback tweeter using the hashtag AJStream. Joining her on the couch today is Emeka Okafor, co-founder and curator of Maker Fair Africa. Emeka, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm glad to be here as well. Absolutely. We're going to go to talk about the topic in just a minute, but before I must introduce this device standing right before us, this is the MakerBot Replicator. It's the third generation in a phenomenal technology from MakerBot, and we're going to be learning what it is and what it's doing in just a moment. Before that, remember you can follow us on Pinterest backslash AJStream. There you'll find, actually go to Pinterest.com slash AJStream. There you're gonna find all kinds of images from stories that we're following and visual content that's curated from social media. Just another way that you can be in the stream. Now here's one of the luminaries of the maker movement in the stream. The whole idea of making is something that um, I, I think even extends beyond technology. It's part of our human nature. We're all makers. We all do things. And I think uh, what we've tapped into is, is a sense of um, using making to create culture, to um, seeing making as a form of self-expression, a way to communicate with um, friends, to share what you do. And you get to be known by the projects you make and the, um, the interests that you share with others. Need a cup, a tool, even a bicycle? Don't run to the store and buy one. Make it yourself with a 3D printer. Earlier, we had a friend come by to demonstrate just how it works. Hey, I'm Marty McGuire with MakerBot Industries, and this is the MakerBot Replicator. It's a 3D printer that takes a spool of plastic. Uh, it's ABS plastic, the same kind of stuff that Legos are made from, and pulls it down through a motor and, and heats it up and works sort of like a robotic hot glue gun and uh, it's actually about to start here. And uh, what it's doing is forcing that plastic out of the nozzle and uh, drawing a little picture in two dimensions. And then uh, it moves up a little bit and draws on top of that. And then layer by layer, it builds up your 3D object. And uh, we're gonna be printing a little model of the Empire State Building. Now that model is growing as we speak and hopefully we're going to be able to show you the finished product at the end of the show. But 3D printers are being used to make everything from drones to buildings and even human tissue. It's all part of maker culture or the do-it-yourself movement. It's pretty basic too. When something breaks, instead of buying a new one, you fix it. When you need something, create it. But then maker culture goes one step further. You share what you've created with others, making it all open source. Listen to this young girl in Detroit describing her experiences with maker culture. This is a video from a project that we found to be extremely compelling. It's all about the Mount Elliott makerspace. Take a listen. Besides building things, I like to fix things. Like I fix the stereo and their speakers. I use the drill, a hammer, and um, a heat gun. I think a screwdriver. Yeah, a screwdriver too. Now, maker culture is being picked up around the world, bringing with it great potential for innovation and development. Joining us to examine the maker phenomenon is Bree Pettis, CEO and co-founder of MakerBot Industries. He's also founded Thingiverse, where people share their creations and digital designs, and NYC Resistor, a Brooklyn-based hacker collective. Bree, welcome to the stream. Hey, it's great to be on the stream. It's great to have you here, man. Talk to us in your own terms. Tell us what is maker culture? So, you know, I think for whatever reason, the dominant culture is all about consuming, about buying things, about if you have a problem, you, you go shopping. But maker culture interrupts all that. When you're, when, you, when you're a maker, when you make things and there's a challenge, you can make your way out of it. You can make something. You can create something that will solve that. And we're in the best time ever to be a maker. The, uh, if you want to make something in electronics, they're modular. You can take a GPS unit and combine it with something else and, and mash them up together to, to create the thing that you want. There's, there's resources now that we have you know, the massive power of the internet and we've got Thingiverse, there's resources. Something like what you want might have been created and you can, you can check it out, you can download it, you can remash it, you can push it together, you can remake it, you can make it your own, you can customize it. 
It's just like the best time ever to be a maker. Yeah, that's amazing. And I want to show people on my screen, this is from Thingiverse. This is the Empire State Building by Hoken. I can take a look at this 3D image as it moves, see all kinds of different angles from it. And this is in fact what we are building right now today here in the stream. Now, Emika, people build all kinds of things in maker culture. And I know that you helped to start Maker Fair Africa. We talked about it briefly in the pre-show, but tell for our broadcast audience what Maker Fair Africa is. And I know you've got an example of something to show us. Yeah, well, Maker Fair Africa is looking to celebrate uh, the idea of being a maker, being an inventor, being an innovator, and spotlighting them, and more or less saying that particularly in the African context, that these people are really very important. If anything, they're more important than almost anyone else because they form the substrate for what you could call a culture that builds things, a culture that builds everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, at our fairs, uh, we've had an assemblage of these types of individuals who run the gamut, you know, from people who work with agricultural machinery to people who are self-taught designers. Um, the person or the item that you were referring to when you spoke about something that I could bring because I was asked to bring something was a young man by the name of Cyrus Kabiru who is a budding self-taught designer out of Kenya and he makes the most amazing assemblage of uh, uh, eyeglasses that are just a part of what he does and the item I have here which you know is quite iconic in so many ways should I put it on? Yeah, absolutely okay. we want to see it. Uh, okay. Wonderful. So, um, as you can see, his, uh, what he does is something that is interesting uh, at so many levels. Yes. He, he didn't go to design school. Uh, you have on the screen in front of you, I don't know if you, the viewers can see oh, it, seen it yeah. examples of what else he's able to do. And our thinking is, if we can bring people like this together with people who work with 3D printers or um, uh, robotics or uh, things that work in the agricultural area, we are telling people that the idea of creation, the idea of invention, mm -hmm. is not limited to what you studied in school. It's, limit it's not limited by anything. It's largely based on your passion well, and your need it's to interesting create things. Because it's got some significant implications. And I remember when I, I did go to the first Maker Fair Africa, I was happy to be in Accra, and I saw a young man there who had basically had a lamp and you could flip a switch and the light came on, but he showed how it was connected to a photovoltaic array that he'd built. And then it had a little slot in it. And he's like, oh yeah, this is where you plug in your cell phone charger. And I was looking at it and I'm like, wait a minute. So you've basically created a technology which could bring electricity and telecommunications to any village anywhere on the planet that has sunshine. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, this is a 19 year old college kid. So this is more than just an esoteric concept. People are really putting it into practice. I want to get to our community and some of their thoughts. And this is a really interesting one. Exactly. Bree, I will pose this to you. This is a tweet from Christina who says, I think the, recently po the recent popularity um, is a reaction to the overabundance of consumer goods. People take pride in meeting their own needs. Is this about finding out where our things come from and, and, and not relying on big companies to make our products? Yeah, I mean, up until now, when you wanted something, or if you wanted to design something, you had to think about making 10,000 or 100,000 of them. So we had to think really generally and make it apply to all sorts of people. But when you have, you, when you have a MakerBot, you, you, you're the only person you need to satisfy. It only has to make you happy, so you can just make what you want, and it's only, you don't have to please 10,000 people when you design it. The other thing is that when you make it on a MakerBot, you're it right when you need it, right where you need it. It's not being made in some foreign country and put on a ship and a truck and a train and a bus and a, and sitting, keep being kept warm in a store. You want it, download it, you design it, you make it, and you've got what you need right there. So it, it cuts a lot of things out of the equation. So one of the interesting things we've seen as we've been researching maker culture is that the actual conception of, of these maker bots uh, is extended beyond um, the confines of what one would expect. So for example, what we see here, this MakerBot, the replicator is using plastic to create this, but there are also MakerBots that are, or devices uh, similar that are being used to create uh, elements using living tissue. And this is one example that I think is worth taking a look at. Yeah, I mean, the invention that we've uh, discovered is a way to uh, print living cells in a material uh, that can uh, be used to reconstruct tissues in the body. My laboratory is interested in regenerating cartilage wherever it's found in the body. 
The process starts with a scan of an ear. We sit someone down in a, in a chair and we have a camera that spins around their head and takes a 3D image of their, of their head. We then can very precisely map out the topology of the ear. The next kind of key step is developing the ink for this printer. This ink is actually a living ink. It contains living cells. It's alive when we put it into the printer. It's alive when it comes out of the printer. The real power of the printing technique is that it can be used to make geometries that you just can't make with any other technique. You can make parts with holes in them. We can layer and, and cover and, and put different uh, cells next to each other to create really the complex organs that make up our bodies. Now, this is fascinating. So we've seen this example here. Bree, I'm curious, I don't know that that technology would necessarily be open source, but would you consider it to count as a part of maker culture? You know, it's, we're the 3D printing organs, we're still at the beginning. We actually have an experimental tool head called the Frostreuter, which is a syringe that you can put anything in. And we've played with chocolate and jam and Nutella, but you can put anything in there, and including living tissue. Uh -huh. and experiment and see what you can do. So while this might seem like it's out of reach, it's not. You can get in there and do this. So you're it's telling me new... you guys are yeah. considering making maker bots that can make anything, and I could actually create for myself a chocolate Empire State Building. Yeah, I mean, and then it goes on from there. I want to see maker bots on the moon making the next moon base. So you can just take it as, as far as you want. This, we're, we're just living in a time of such great potential energy and possibility. And the person who's going to make this happen is is you. I love it, Malika. Well, Emma Kay, I want to know where this is being um, being used. There's a tweet here from Design Lemon who says, "Maker culture has deep roots in places like Africa, where grassroots ingenuity has been a necessity for for years." And before you you comment on that, um, I want to play this video question, and perhaps you can elaborate on it. On that. You to um, I want to play this video question. Just wondering, is there an actual increase? Let me just restart that. Sorry about that. In banks from the Let me just restart that. Sorry about that. Just wondering. I seem to be having technical difficulties, but um, this is a question from Ken Banks, and he's wondering is there an increase in the hacker um, and maker culture across Africa, or do we just think this is because this is the first time that social media has allowed uh, the public to see it? Um, it's a combination of those two trends. Uh, we've always had makers in the continent, and as I mentioned earlier, the challenge has been um, having the platforms or f tapping into the community where they can interact and cross-pollinate with each other. Uh, so there's that f aspect of them pre-existing, uh, but there's also the aspect of us looking to cross-pollinate what they are doing in places like Africa with what people may be doing here in the United States or in Europe. So there is um, a number of dual, there are these dual trends that we would like to sort of um, foster and to some degree nudge along, even though to a large extent they're self-assembling, that speak to how do we propagate what we already have, but how, in doing so blend it in with ideas that are coming in from elsewhere. So the open source culture, for example, exists to some extent um, in, in parts of the African software space, uh, but not to the extent that it, does, it should, we would like to see in the open source hardware movement, mm -hmm. which, is what, um, which is where the MakerBot more or less finds itself. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at the pre-existing uh, elements that exist and the sort of cross-pollination that is happening back and forth within various regions, which is something that we find tremendously exciting. Now, Emeka, I want us to get a closer shot with our Steadicam of this MakerBot, because as you can see, it is actually building this device. If you can just look at the Steadicam shot, it is building this device. We're looking in, if we can get real close, it's just finished, just now. And I want to uh, try to, Bree, is this thing gonna burn me if I pick up this new device we've printed? No, 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 just pop it right off, hot okay. off the bot. So I'm gonna pop it right off of the bot and hold it up so that everyone can see it. This is the Empire State Building. If we can get a steady cam shot right here. This is the Empire State Building that we have just created with our maker bot right here in the Stream Studio. It is wicked fly. 
I'm going to put it down <laughs> just there. And you were mentioning, Emeka, this idea of open source hardware. I think that there's a really interesting project called Open Source Ecology that speaks to that point and some of the implications. Let's take a look. Open Source Ecology is a network of farmers, engineers, and supporters that for the last two years have been building the Global Village Construction Set, a set of the 40 different machines that it takes to create a small civilization with modern day comforts. The Global Village Construction Set is like a life-size Lego set in which motors, parts, and power units can interchange. Thus far, we have prototyped 8 of the 40 machines and have published all of the 3D designs, schematics, instructional videos, and budgets on our wiki. The cost of making or buying our machines are, on average, 8 times cheaper than buying from an industrial manufacturer. So you look at something like this and basically it seems like they're making the, the building blocks of creating societies. What do you think about this project? Well, this project is very close to our heart. I say our heart because it, it, it's beginning to seem like a family of sorts. Uh, the person who founded the Global Vision Construction Set um, initiative is a fellow by the name of Martin Jakubowski, who op also happens to be a TED fellow. Uh, and his work, in many ways, represents um, the full possibility of how fundamental the open source hardware movement could be to society at large. Mm -hmm. uh, because what he's speaking about, and it wasn't uh, picked upon in the video because we don't have all his videos here, is the fact that if, for example, you are a farmer or you're an aspiring farmer mm -hmm. and you are looking to acquire equipment that would allow you to farm, uh, the costs of doing so are fairly high because mm -hmm. of the proprietary nature of the technology that exists. Uh, what he's looking to do is get down to the very basics of uh, industrial infrastructure and say, yes, yeah, so you can buy a, a tractor that's going to cost you an eighth of what an existing tractor costs you with all the fundamental attributes built into it. Mm -hmm. And the ecosystem of machines that he's looking to put together uh, with others, it's not just him, it's actually a rapidly growing community, uh, will, uh, as it succeeds, uh, fan out and, and sort of find its way into the very fabric of many things that are done proprietarily. And the impact could be huge. Uh, and our, there's the sense that it could even be more in those parts of the world where we haven't seen an industrial te mm -hmm. um, um, technology culture take root, like in Africa. So, so this is actually something that I want to dive a little deeper into. And Bree, I want to get you in on this. Specifically, you, the issue of getting investment in open source technologies, because a lot of people will say, look at the community and say, okay, well, why would someone put their money into something that's not going to be proprietary? Now, for those within the open source community, they realize that there are lots of ways you can make money that are not necessarily based upon a proprietary tool or technology. But Bree, could you speak a little bit to that? Why would somebody put money into open source venture? I mean, I think when we, you know, when we're kids, we think, you know, we're taught that sharing works. When you give, you get more. And something happened, you know, maybe with capitalism, where people thought, okay, I have to keep this all secret. I have to not share, and that'll work. But now, when we're in this, now we're in this networked world. Now we're in the age of sharing, where if you're not sharing, nobody knows about you. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the, with with MakerBot is we share our designs. We share all of the, the, the ways that we make things. We, you know, from the, the schematics for the electronics to the, the designs for the laser cut files. And so that it, when you get a MakerBot, you know how it works. You can check it out. You can get to the, you can really, you, you get another gift besides just getting a MakerBot. You get the knowledge of how it works. Now, okay. there's the making aspect of things and, and getting people to make more things in the maker movement. But there's also the sharing part of this. This is where the open source thing comes in. We do it. We encourage our users to do it, the MakerBot operators of the world. We encourage anybody to do it who makes things, who develops infrastructure so that the next generation can benefit from this, so that everybody else in the world can 
can benefit from this. So what Emeka is doing in Africa is building up infrastructure so that people can share what they do. They're not just making, but they're making and sharing so that everybody benefits from, the, from their research and from their work. What, uh, what the Open Source Ecology Project is doing with the farm tools is they're making it so that if you want to have a farm, you can have the infrastructure and you can do it yourself and you can have all that kind of, all the, that machinery is stuff that you, you don't have to go to the, 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 you don't have to go to the garage or have somebody mm -hmm. else come and work on your, your tractor because you built it, you know how it works, you can fix it. Well, so now the government is actually investing in helping more people to learn these techniques and specifically the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, has been making some investments in young people's education in maker culture, but there's some controversy around that. Exactly, and Amika, I'd like you to listen to this video and comment on this. Well, I think it's rather uh, strange that uh, what basically Make Magazine um, describes is that really a community maker program um, is funded by the military. Like, really, why is that necessary? Why does the children's program require military funding? It seems very strange. Um, and when you look at some of the requirements that DARPA have for the program, such as they want unlimited rights to everything the children produce, um, a job advert uh, requires you to have a secret level clearance to design programs um, for uh, the mentor program, which I thought was very bizarre. Um, and also the actual um, things that they wanted children to do, such as design unmanned ve flying vehicles, which to you and me might suggest drones, perhaps. Well, really, actually, Emeka, if you could briefly respond. Well, I, I think it's useful for people to be reminded that some of the technologies that we use today were actually primed by the same defense. Um, advanced research uh, project. I'm not sure if I'm getting the acronym yeah, DARPA. wrong. They basically uh, built the internet. Yes. So, you know, most technologies do have dual use. Mm -hmm. uh, it's rare that you come across any technology that doesn't. I think to some extent it's important that we applaud the fact that uh, at least there are those who see the propagating of maker spaces and hacker spaces across the country as useful. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good first step. Mm -hmm. In terms of the details of this particular project, I'm, I'm not privy to those details, so I couldn't exactly comment on what they are. But I think we should ask ourselves, well, sometime, uh, it's important that we find those who can prime the pump and ask the necessary questions as we do so, as opposed to um, completely finding fault with it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good point. And there are actually some interesting questions that are coming up around this. I want to ask you and Bree to stay with us because we're going to continue the conversation into our post show. Before we do that, let's go to Malika who's looking at some of the other leads that we're following in the stream. Our feed has been inundated with tweets, links, and videos surrounding the hashtag Coney2012. Referencing a film produced by the nonprofit organization Invisible Children, it's aimed at raising awareness about child soldiers in Uganda. Well, the group says it's highlighting abuses committed by the Lord's Resistance Army and its leader Joseph Kony, while also raising support for Kony's arrest. But the campaign is not without its critics. Please, everyone, it is not about an organization wanting to do good in Africa. It's about us being sidelined as bit players in the shaping of our future, tweets TMS Rouge. And from Innovate Africa, there are plenty of examples of children and youth from North Uganda who are agents of their change. Don't let Invisible convince you otherwise. You'll find more in this story, including original tweets and pictures at stream.aljazeera.com. Our next lead's from New York, where a parody campaign rewards people who've been victims of police stop and frisk policies. Three strikes year in, granted participants a coupon for the McDonald's Happy Meal for recording the offending officer's badge number. Well, you can vote all of these stories up or down on our website at stream.aljazeera.com slash leads. Derek? Thank you, Malika. And I want to uh, continue. We want to know that on th want you to know that on Thursday, we're looking at a landmark U.S. Supreme Court case against Shell Oil's dealings in Nigeria. Until then, we're going to continue our conversation on maker culture with some significant questions, namely, does it potentially increase the uh, line between the haves and the have-nots? If you don't have the raw materials, can you make? In the meantime, check out this maker guitar produced with a 3D printer by Red Eye On Demand. We'll see you online.
Hey, welcome back. We are now going to continue our conversation about maker culture. You can see from my screen, or at least from my table, that we have here this wonderful device. This is a version of the uh, actual Empire State Building that we were able to build right here on our MakerBot Live. I also want you to take a look at my screen, which will show you a little bit of where this comes from. We mentioned it earlier, that Thingiverse, a project started by our guest, Pete Pettis, actually showed us how to do this. This is the very design that we used to make this on our bot right here. Now we had a very interesting tweet before we went out of the show. This came from mhop7 who asked, won't the maker movement increase the gap between haves and have nots? If you cannot afford the materials, you cannot make. What's your take on that, Emeka? Well, I, there, there is the potential that the maker movement will actually upend a number of things because if we look at how the production culture or framework is built today, you have mass production, be it here, be it in China, um, and then it's distributed and we end up consuming. Uh, what we may be looking at or what might be, begin, what might be emerging is something that flips that on the head where the manufacturing is actually so much more local. Not to say that everyone will manufacture mm -hmm. everything, but we'll have a, a broader, deeper uh, group of people who are involved in this culture of production, as some would call it. And when that happens, it won't be just a case of an item is dispensed by this mega corporation yeah. that answers just to its shareholders and elsewhere. Uh, it's a, there's a good chance we may begin to see um, many, many corporations, a much smaller, maybe we'll not call them corporations. And to some extent, at some scale, we're beginning to see that. So mm. it, if anything, it's, I would contend that it has democratizing effects mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, an effect that will lead to an increasing divide. So this is interesting, Bree, because it may indeed have democratizing effects, but it also seems to answer one of the issues that a lot of people have raised about the American economy in particular right now, which is that it is no longer focused in manufacturing and some of the economic stagnation may be uh, derived from that fact. Can maker culture actually be a source of macroeconomic growth? And do you see any kind of support for this coming from the U.S. government? You know, um, no, we haven't gotten any support from the U.S. government. Uh, <laughs> Um, when we started, we had, you know, our first 20 machines that we made. And there was this, like, potential energy in the air of, like, what are people going to make with these things? How are, we gonna, how, are they, how are they going to change the world with these machines? And we thought, okay, we're going to put these up on our website and people are going to get them. And, and we're going to change manufacturing in America. And then we got our orders and half of them were from other countries. So we had to kind of shift it and think like, okay, how are we going to change manufacturing in the world? How are we going to how are we going to make this personal? How are we going to make you? Your, how, how are we going to make how are we going to turn your desktop into a factory for the things that you need? And it's not just an American thing; it's it's a worldwide thing. And I think with what Emeka is saying, like, as humans, we are naturally makers. We are naturally creative b creatures. And as we get more and more tools. You know, we, we figured out industrialization so we can make big factories to make things. Well, now we're making that personal and making it so anybody they can make things and they can share it and everybody can benefit. So this has got really interesting implications for me on the international front. And we're getting a tweet from at BCATDC that says, the root of maker culture is learning skills via the internet. I'm self-taught on almost all skills I use day to day. Emeka, what does this mean for developing countries? I go home to Ghana and I see all of this possibility when you move from a culture where previously we have all these raw materials coming out of Africa going to other countries to be refined and then sold back to us. Now you have people embracing this entrepreneurial sense, which I'd argue actually has been in the culture for a very long time, but now having the technology to make all kinds of different devices. What does this potentially mean for the future of development in emerging economies? Well, I, I think one of the things that it, it could point to is it, the degree to which it's, it could be very empowering. Because, you know, typically when we think of manufacturing, manufacturing or production, the sense is that it can only be done at a certain scale. By no means uh, uh, am I saying, or I don't think anyone is saying that, you know, we'll be able to um, make steel on our desktop. But 
uh, there is a good chance that over the next few years we will see these processes broken down where uh, the idea of uh, producing things is no longer seen as something with such a high bar. Mm -hmm. you know, and that high bar, once it's mentally addressed, uh, allows people to think very differently about how they can make things. Um, in the area of making, you're finding uh, approaches towards uh, how we can make integrated circuit boards, which typically we only associate with l massive foundries that cost half a billion dollars. W will this materialize in two years? No one knows. But the mindset within the maker culture is we should be able to do it with the tools we have. And it's feeding on itself. We we're finding this sort of thinking Ex, um, expand into a whole range of industries. Mm. Um, medical robotics, you know, there's an open source medical robotics uh, project that looks to open the idea of building medical surgical robotics from an open source standpoint. And when you have that pervasive understanding of uh, the ability to do and make, it really expands the possibilities hugely. And the impact in development will be huge because it will be development that's actually coming from within as opposed to development that is being uh, helicoptered in. Excellent. Well, we may not be able to make steel in our desk, as you said, but I want to show this that's on my laptop. And this is um, an image uh, intersecting the two things we talked about in our show today. This is something that someone made with the 3D printer, and it's Kony. So it's around that hashtag mm -hmm. of uh, Kony 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, but along those lines, Bree, uh, I, want to, I want to play this video, Sot, and direct this to you. I'm Nikki Usher, a professor at George Washington School of Media and Public Affairs. Just wanted to let you know that maker culture, hacker culture, and DIY culture is an essential part of internet architecture and an essential part of how the internet is put together. So if that's true, that leads into this tweet from Ali Glinesk, who says, what is the relationship between the maker movement and hacking? So. Let's see, that's a, that, awesome. So one of the cool things about the time we're in now is, you know, when, ha when people started hacking on things back in the day, they started, it, it was really about being creative. And then the media got a hold of the word to mean basically criminal. And we, the makers of the world have taken the word hack back as our own to mean something you do creatively with stuff. So you can either, when you're hacking on software, you're actually using it the way you want to use it. You're, you're using it to do the things that you, you need. And when you're hacking on hardware, you're using hardware to do the things you need. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily the way it was made for. So um, I think when we're talking about how hacking and making connect, they're really like good friends. They really work together. They're like, it's the, it's, yeah. So that's how I would basically say like making and hacking, good friends. <laughs> so we get in this tweet from at ricecake5746 that's saying that this culture would reconnect the user with the means of production for a start, educate yes, yes, yes. rather than consume, educate. Uh, is this something that we should be integrating, Emeka, into the way we teach our children? Well, uh, the twi uh, Twitter, Twitter is actually speaking to something that is a very fundamental, a fundamental foundation of why um, I actually got involved in Make a Fair Africa. Uh, there are so many deficiencies in our educational institutions in Africa, as they are here, but I, I would argue that they're even more so in Africa, where people learn by rote, they, they uh, go to school to pass exams, but they, they essentially don't know how to use a screwdriver, literally. Um, making strips away the nonsense, it strips away the fluff. Not to say that it's a panacea, but it, it, it brings down the idea of learning and tools to its bare essentials. You know, and there is a certain kind of pride, even with the very young, as much as much older people, that you immediately see when people think they produce something. Mm -hmm. And embedded within that process, you have all these other skills that are more or less interleaved within what they're doing without it being explicit. So, for example, when we see the success of robotic Ex, uh, uh, competitions run by FIRST Robotics here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the kids are having fun, but at the same time, they're learning physics, they're learning mechanics, they're learning engineering without being told they're doing so. And mm -hmm. you can more or less graph that into a whole range of fields. So I think that the maker culture, and I am not the first one, there are many who are 
saying more or less the same thing, should be a fundamental component of our educational system from preschool yeah. right up into the universities. You know, it's so funny. I don't want to make this a TED love fest, but I have to mention that another TED fellow uh, who's a longtime friend of mine, before either of us ever got connected to TED, uh, his name is Marvin Hall. Uh, he's Jamaican. And he was a fellow at, I think, one of the, inter the London conferences a yeah. couple years ago. And Marvin started this project called Halls of Learning, mm -hmm. where he took kids from the worst ghettos in Kingston, Jamaica, some yeah. of the most dangerous communities. And in the year that I first started working with him, Jamaica had the highest murder rate on the planet. He took kids from some of those worst communities, put them in a program to teach them robotics, mm -hmm. Lego robotics, and it developed to the point where they're winning international awards. Bree, I'm curious if you could speak to that sense that what does it mean when somebody goes from perhaps the the feeling that they need outside sources to get the basic resources they would use on a day-to-day -day basis to feeling that they can literally be the creators of whatever, perhaps a mastering of their destiny in ways that they might not have imagined before. You know, when I was growing up, in order to learn about like fixing bikes, I had to either like just try things out on my bike when it broke or go to the library. But now we've got the internet. And so you know, or maybe I would have had to go to school to learn how to do it, but you don't have to do that anymore. You can actually use the resources of the communities that are, are out there that do stuff and share and make things happen without it. And it's, it seems so easy to say like, okay, yeah, you don't need to go to school to do everything that you used to have to go to school, but it's really profound and it's deep when you, when, when people want to make things and they can just see what other people have done and get started. It's very powerful. So I think we want to show one last thing. We're going to finish on that point. Uh, uh, Bree, thank you so much. And thank you, Emeka. And thank you, Malika, for getting our community involved. We have one final clip that we want to show you. This is of President Obama actually meeting with some young makers right here in the United States. We'll leave you with the experience of what happened there. Tweet us at hashtag AJStream. We'll see you online. OK, here we go. So you just press this button right here. and. I'll probably angle this way so it doesn't hit that person closer. Yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh! Let's look at the. Let's go look at the marshmallows. See what happens. Here. Oh my gosh! Let's see. Watch the claw there, guys. <laughs> it came out pretty fast. Yeah. Huh? But it, it looks safe. Yeah. I shot myself at the TV at size, so make sure nobody else. You shot yourself with the marshmallow?